Okay. So understand option only unilateral contract we use. Now the contracts that we actually use, depending on what state you're in, are all going to be different. Now I will tell you though, usually within the state, every person that is a realtor, what does that mean? They are a member of the NAR, which means they are also a member of the state association like the VAR, the Virginia Association of Realtors, or the IAR, the Indiana Association, they all use that contract no matter where they're at because they use the state form. We are not a licensed attorney. So that's another misnomer. You often hear agents say, well, I got to go write a contract tonight. No, you're actually not writing a contract. That requires you to be a practicing attorney. What we are going to be doing is filling in the blank in a pre-printed form that was written by our state association's attorney and says, here, here's this four page purchase agreement. All you need to do is fill in the buyer's name. You need to fill in the time they want to close and the purchase price and blah, 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 blah. All right. So we are not actually writing a contract. We are filling in 27 blanks in a pre-printed form. That's what we are doing. So you should become familiar with your contracts. Unfortunately, we don't cover this in this course because every state is different. This will be something that your managing broker or your principal broker or the boss will go over once you get to whatever brokerage you have decided to use. Okay. Sales contracts. This is the purchase agreement. You will hear it called the offer, the purchase offer, the purchase and sales contract. It's got all kinds of different names, depending on where you practice which state. And it involves the same concept. There's the offer. There is a counter offer, or there could be a counter offer. And remember that a counter offer is a rejection of the original offer. It will require an acceptance and it must be in writing because we work under the statute of frauds. There is this other thing here, and I am not a fan of this word binder. You will often hear this called a short form purchase agreement, short form. Now I want you to write in your book or in your notes, there's actually another word that is probably more common and used a lot if you decide you want to go into the commercial world. It is called a letter of intent. The slang is LOI. All right. So bear with me here. I told you that we use pre-printed forms for our state associations. Now you can make the logical connection through there that we talked earlier that our state association is a member of the national association, which is typically re residential real estate. Now I'm not saying that you can't do commercial in there, but I'm saying typically the NAR is residential. So we use this generic pre-printed form that we fill the blanks in. However, in the commercial world, and I'm talking about real commercial, big commercial, you know, you're selling a mall, you're selling the 14 story building downtown skyscraper. And those are usually done by your big commercial companies, Marcus and Millichap, Cushman and Wakefield. Those, because that is such an intricate deal, those purchase agreements typically get written by their in-house attorney to be very specific to that property. Okay. Well, you do not want to spend and the money to hire an attorney to write a specific purchase agreement and then get countered five or six times because you may end up spending thousands of dollars just to get to the purchase agreement. Well, that seems stupid. 
And it is. So what happens is that the two brokers, along with their buyer and their seller respectively, will actually play this game called what if? All right, that's what I call it. I don't know if anybody else calls it that. And what they do is the buyer is going to write a letter of intent or the LOI, and he's going to say something in bullet point form. It is not a purchase agreement because he's not an attorney. It's usually just a word document Everyone that I have, everyone that I've ever used is just a Word document that has a bunch of what ifs in it. So the buyer is going to say, what if we offered you $1.8 million? And what if we said we'll pay for the environmental? What if you pay for the closing? What if we wear a green turtleneck during the closing? Would you accept that offer? All right, because it's not a purchase agreement, it's not a contract. I can do that. And then I send that letter of intent to you. And you as the listing agent go to your seller and go, hey, dude, we've got this guy that has an intent to offer. And here's his terms. What do you think? And the seller says, well, I like the 1.4 million. But I really want to wear a blue turtleneck. So ask them that. So then the listing agent says, well, what if we wear a blue turtleneck? And we can play this game back and forth forever. And then we agree on these five points. Hey, we're, what if we offered you 1.8? What if we did the environmental? What if you paid the uh, closing cost. What if we close by January the 1st? What if we wear green turtlenecks? And we say, okay, yeah, we all agree. Now what happens is you take this one purchase, uh, this one, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, this one letter of intent to an attorney and go, okay, I want you to write me a purchase agreement and I want you to incorp incorporate these five points that we discussed, and he writes one purchase agreement, you now send that legal offer over to the seller, and the seller says, yes, we'll take that. Da-da, da, of course you will, because we've already negotiated the terms of this contract in advance under that LOI. Now, why I do not like the word binder is because this letter of intent is not legally binding. It's not a contract. It's just two good old boys sitting around having a beer talking. Well, what if I did this? And what if you did that? And we agreed on it. And then I go to the attorney I say, write me a purchase agreement with those five things, and he writes it up, and I send it over to you as the listing agent, and you go, nope, we uh, we changed our mind. We're not going to accept this. And you go, but, uh, but, 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 but you, you, you signed that letter uh, of intent. Yes, I did. But that's not a contract. Therefore, it's not legally binding. So the word binder is really, really a bad word in here, all right? The most common term that you will see used is a letter of intent. And most, if not all, letter of intents that I have ever seen start out in the very first paragraph saying that this letter of intent is not legally binding on either party, all right? So a binder is a bad word. Now, there is this term that I know you guys have heard, it is called earnest money. Earnest money is the evidence that the buyer gives to the seller to prove that he is earnest in carrying out the deal. It usually is given when they make the offer. 
the amount of earnest money can be anything you want. It actually can be a negotiation point. So if they're offering $1.4 million and you're putting $500 down as earnest money, that seller may say, you know what? I like 1.5, but 500 is easily walked away from. I want him to put $25,000 down as earnest money. Counter that. All right. Earnest money counts as a credit to the buyer. It is part of the purchase price. So if they agreed and the buyer says, look, I'll buy the property for 100,000 and I'm giving you 5,000 as earnest money on the day of closing, how much does the buyer bring? 95 grand, because the five he gave as earnest money actually counts towards the purchase price. It is typically held by the listing agent. Now, I will tell you, this is becoming less and less common, and it's now being held more and more by title companies so that the listing agent doesn't have to deal with all the accounting and bookkeeping and rules and regulations of all that or any of the potential problems that we are going to talk about right down here. Because if I'm not holding the money, I can't run into these two issues down here number five and six, in which we'll talk about, all right? If it is held by whomever, it must be agreed upon and the amount agreed upon by the buyer and seller. That earnest money cannot earn interest. Let me take that back. That's actually wrong. That earnest money can earn interest but if it does, it has to be credited or distributed to the buyer. All right. So you as the managing broker or me in the example we've been talking about throughout this course, I cannot put that money in the bank, earn interest and then keep that interest for me. So most of the time, what a managing broker will do with their earnest money account is just simply make it non-interest bearing. That way we don't have to worry about, well, you put $5,000 in two months ago, it's earned 12 cents. So now you get $5,000 and 12 cents credit. That's too hard to mess with. So most brokers just make their earnest money bank account um, non-interest bearing, okay? The amount should be large enough to make sure the buyer doesn't default in the property. And it should be large enough to make the seller feel comfortable in taking the property off the market. So it's a delicate dance. As the buyer, uh, and you're working with the buyer, your job is to actually submit the lowest amount of earnest money you can get away with. As the listing agent, your job is to try and get the most amount of earnest money you can get away with. So what happens is this. The earnest money or the lender actually will have a separate bank account. They will have, it will be distinct from any other bank account they've got. It must be identified as an earnest money account. All right. So typically most managing brokers have two bank accounts. They have a general bank account, which they pay the rent out of and things like that. And then they have this earnest money account so that when they collect a buyer's earnest money, it goes into this very special, specifically designed account and it must be identified in such a manner that all parties know it's an earnest money account. So you can name it earnest money account, impound account, escrow account, whatever you want to name it. So that when if somebody asks you, hey, man, which one's which you could go, oh, well, that one's named earnest money. 
That one's named general account. It's very obvious which one the earnest money check goes into. Okay. So you can have multiple accounts as a banker or as a broker. There are some agents or some managing brokers that may have multiple earnest money accounts. And there are reasons why you might want to do that. Maybe one of them you use for commercial deals and one of them you use for residential. There's some other financial reasons you don't want to have too much money in one account because it may not be covered by the FDIC. So you don't want to have 8.3 million in this earnest money account because that may be uh, in jeopardy. Don't worry about that too much.